So there are, there are identity patterns here. Now, let me walk you through just some examples. Hunter-gatherer uh, civilization is a big argument. I don't believe this is a civilization, but everybody else who puts the class together did, so they, they made me say it. But look at the Bushmen. I think these are patterns of life, but they are pre-civilizational. They, they don't have the carrying capacity of civilization. They don't have enough information. But look at, look at the Australian Aborigines, the Bushmen, the Kalahari, the Indians, the Brazilian rainforest. You could have added Papua New Guinea. I mean, any place where you are forced, and, and this is the definition of a hunting-gathering society, you are forced to keep moving. That is, you, you, can, you, can, you can clear a plot, you plant for a little while, and then you move. And then you clear a plot, and you plant for a little while, or you gather food and you hunt. But you're limited by the carrying capacity of the ecosystem. What's the number one characteristic I just said that affects the capacity to become a civilization? They're, they're unstable. They're unstable they're, in what sense? They, 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 have no, they have no residency. They have right. No place. And since they have no residency, what is it they can't do? They can't set down roots. They can't establish right. a civilization. And therefore, what, what is it? It's very specific. Huh? Housing. They don't have housing, or they have very, very shallow housing. And therefore, when they move, what do they have to do? They have to move everything with them so they can't get any possessions. So exactly. They have no idea you can't of accumulate. You can't accumulate. Since you can't accumulate, you cannot build several centuries of, profit, of property. That's right. The minute somebody invents, and it was probably initially, uh, not wheat, but related to wheat, one of the cereals. But the minute you get potatoes or rice or a cereal, and you can stay in one place, you now have great-grandfather's stool and great-grandmother's ceramics. Plus the land that you're working it on. But then you're, you've jumped to property rights. We're not there yet. It's not property rights yet. It's simply the notion that now you can accumulate. And because you can accumulate, and other things happen. If you read a wonderful book called, called uh, The Forest People, uh, which is very romantic about the pygmies to the last chapter, where he points out that, it, that this society means you die if you have a disability, because it can't afford to carry you. Now you suddenly have people Wait. disabled. Right. Say that again? In, in a hunting-gathering society, the weakest members die, because you can't afford to carry them. In terms of survival of the the ruthless kind of survival. I mean, I mean, it's all wonderful and it's all romantic in the 90-minute film, and then you start thinking about the 12-year-old who has a limp, and they're not going to make it. And 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 it's a wonderful book by Colin. Uh, 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 let's see, the uh, the the mountain people and the forest people. I can't remember Colin's last name right now. I'll come to him anyway. I haven't read it in th th almost 30 years, but it it is a. Uh, it's very romantic. It's very wonderful. Look how natural they are. And then you realize the cost of being natural. Here, suddenly, you live longer because you're not moving. You suddenly get, guess what, guess what lifespan? Like, what, 40, 50 years? Sure. What, what, what's the Bible says the natural lifespan? Three, four, and ten. Huh? Three, four, and ten. Right, 70. We just passed it in the last, in this century. Up until this century, the natural lifespan. Now, and by the way, it turns out that, 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 that uh, people historically did, didn't die earlier. They died younger. What keeps, life, what keeps average lives low in agricultural society is the number of people who die before they're five. But if you get through five years of age, you have a fairly high likelihood in agricultural society, unless you're a woman who dies in childbirth, of living to be three score and ten. Because you're not, you don't have to move all the time. Now when winter comes, you got a house. You got you got food out back. You've got a root cellar. You've got all sorts of things that are natural. And look, notice how it happens. Agricultural civilizations include Han China, <coughs> Pharaonic Egypt, Indus Valley, Assyria, Sumeria, Babylon, Archaic Greece, the Hellenistic civilization, the Romans, Mayas, Aztecs, Incas. All of those are civilizations predicated on being able to grow food. And they all have similar patterns. And you see the patterns begin to, to evolve. They all have priesthoods of some kind. They all have efforts to understand the supreme being. They all have uh, political organizations and structures. They all have armies. They all have policing systems. They all have arguments over property rights. What, what is a property right? Who owns the property? They all have holidays, which, by the way, comes originally from the term holy day. Bureaucracies. That's right. They all have bureaucracies. You go back to Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. You go back to the Hammurabi, the original order, uh, ruling of uh, writing of the law. 
you, you know, if you have a law, you have to have an enforcer. If you have an enforcer, it's a bureaucrat. I mean, all these systems have their version of the IRS. <laughs> They're all patterns. Now, if then you have those, let's look at suddenly you get the rise of industrial civilizations. Britain, bourgeois France, imperial Germany, America, the Meiji Restoration in, Fran in uh, Japan, and Tsarist Russia. And by the way, you want to see really dramatic change. It is looking at the Meiji Restoration, which occurs in 1868, when you suddenly have a group of younger leaders come together and say, we had better modernize Japan or we're going to be run over. And they systematically go out around, they send teams all over the world. And they go and they study the French and the Germans, the Americans and the British, and they come back, and the Italians, they come back and they say, here's how to modernize Japan. Let's take the best of each of these. And it is the most willfully self-conscious act of modernization on the planet. And they say, look, we are trapped here in agricultural society. This will not work. We have to move to industrial society to survive. If we don't, we'll be devoured by the Europeans. And when they do it, I'll give you just one example. The high water mark in Japanese feudal society of the agricultural system militarily is what? What, what, do, you, what do you call a Japanese warrior? Shogun. 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 Shogun is the guy who organized it. Okay, and samurai are based on the use of what weapon? Swords. 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 And they're magnificent. If you see Kurosawa's great work, The Seven Samurais, it, it's amazing. Okay? The second you move into here, what do you get? Guns. Guns. And the swords become obsolete. The sword becomes obsolete, and so does the samurai way of life. And in 1870, there is a deliberate rebellion by the samurai who get massacred by peasants who have guns. Because they prefer death to dishonor. And it's the symbolic end of the agricultural era in Japan. I mean, again, it doesn't fully end. In fact, in the information age, you can see Japanese factories next to which there are artificially maintained rice patties going all the way back to here. And you see in much of the Japanese uh, drive and energy uh, in the industrial era, uh, the samurai spirit of the warrior and of nobility and of, of doing duty. But my point is, each of these, as you see the transition here, the, for example, the word bourgeois comes from French, means middle class or comes to characterize what we call middle class. Actually, it meant originally the small property holders, the, the small businesses and the small manufacturers. This transition occurs in every one of these countries. The monarchies begin to collapse because the power structure of agriculture doesn't make sense here. Money matters more, land matters less. Land is really important here. So if you're in an old family, you have lots of land, so you marry a new industrial, all sorts of 19th century novels about the new rising industrial class that has cash, deliberately marrying into the landed class for status, trying to make this bridge. Okay? Now, if that's all true, let's look for a second, since this is the one we grew up in. This is a very important thing to keep in your head. What I'm gonna drive at today is not only is it true that we're going through the third wave, but it is a knowable experience because we've done it two other times. So we can study how people have done it. And you are personally doing it. Because every one of you was born in this system. This is the dominant system today. It's still the dominant system. This is the emerging system, the information age. And so, if you think about it, and we're going to take five examples just to give you a way of thinking about it. Five aspects of second wave civilization, of the industrial era. Standardization, synchronization, specialization, massification, and, and, and uh, centralization. Now take a look at these five, and uh, Toffler is now going to walk you through them. And think about how they apply to the way you live your daily life. 